All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first of two panels featuring some of our past Purdue alumni. Uh, my name is Gore. I'm a current senior in the EC department, and I've been part of the Purdue Camp 2 Research Project with Professor Liu for about two years now. I'll move on to my um, co-moderator, Kai Wen. Hi, everyone. My name is Kai Wen, and I'm also a senior student in computer engineering. Um, I'm in Camp Square for about a year and a half. Great, so I'll go on to introducing some of our alumni. Um, Eric is a 2015 Purdue alumni and a 2014 slash 2015 CAM2 alumni. He started his career with ABC Supply as a backend software engineer, focusing on custom job development and continuous integration with CVS slash Git. Uh, by mid 2017, he transitioned to a front end role as a .NET developer. And since 2018, he's been working as a solution architect, owning, designing, and proof of concepts at, of all human capital management solutions. Ling Zhang is currently a master's student in computer science at CMU. She worked in CMU database group, supervised by Professor MD Pavlo. Um, she worked on resource management of database system. She got her bachelor's degree from Purdue University, where she worked in CAM2 for one and a half years. Now Sarah is an undergraduate, master's graduate, Purdue alumni in EC. During her time at Purdue, she did research studying security, vulnerability, and privacy implications of public cameras. Her work involves automated public camera discovery and metadata retrieval, as well as analyzing real-time image and video data from worldwide public cameras. And Jason is a last-minute addition to our panel, and we're very happy he is able to join us today. Um, he graduated from Purdue in 2005 and is now working at Intel as an architect. Today, he will be able to share us with further experience he had in industry. Okay, great. So now I'll introduce our panelists. Um, if all our panelists could give about four to five minutes of their time and talk about their experience as Purdue, academic or non-academic, that would be great. Um, Eric, can we start with you? Sure. Uh, I graduated in Purdue 2015. I was on the CAN2 team. 2014, 2015, as you said. Um, my experience at Purdue, I started as an electrical engineer is what my goal as a major was. And I was really into hardware at the time. Uh, and then I actually went through EC 264. I think that's still the course uh, as of today. And Professor Lee was teaching it. And I got real jazzed up about software. It was real exciting. And I thought, man, this is really cool. Maybe I don't like hardware that much. And so then I like, I'm interested in some projects. I actually joined an Epic's team for a semester and after that, that introduced me to CAM2 and I joined the CAM2 team and I worked on that team for two years. Um, and that was really exciting and that got me really excited about um, software as a whole and taught me a lot of good practices, taught me actual practical applications of Git and how to work with a team. And um, I, that actually propelled me into really a long interest in software. I still graduated with an electrical engineering degree, but uh, that, that passion that I learned from the CAM2 team and from Professor Liu uh, carried me to pursue a software-focused uh, career, and I've been doing that ever since. Great, thank you. Uh, can we move on to Ling? Uh, hi, uh, I'm a, I was a CS major at Purdue. I graduated a year ago, so uh, I, joined, I, I have been in the team for one and a half year, so uh the uh, the reason i joined is when i was uh on my sophomore year deciding like whether i should go directly go to work after graduation or like doing some research and pursue some higher level education after that uh while i was kind of like deciding uh one of my friends claudia like introduced me to uh camp square this uh, this team and saying that if you need it is a very big team doing a lot of different research in different uh, areas so if you want to get a sense of like what research is doing and also exploring like different aspects uh, of like computer science or ECE so you, you can probably join this group so I joined it uh, I was mostly working on uh, the camp Cam Square API and image database. So what we did is we're kind of like having a framework for uh, a, about 130,000 network cameras over the world. 
and we're constructing the API so that researchers can uh, easily and conveniently query those uh, camera data for their uh, research analysis off, off the camera. So we also wanted to build a uh, cam camera image database which stores the actual image information in the database. So that's what I did at Purdue. Um, I think it's very helpful for my uh, current research. So uh, as I was like uh, going through and implementing things, uh, actually building the system, it's giving me a lot of experience and that, can, that I can carry out in my current research, which is doing the, uh, it, which is in the uh, CMU database group. At Camp Square, uh, another thing I learned is like the collaborative skills and leadership skills because we are having a large team. Like when I was there, it was like 17 or 18 students as a team. So each sub team has about four or five or more students. Uh, it's very important to collaborate in your own sub team to achieve your goal. And it's also very important to collaborate like among other teams because we're our work may somewhat related and it's more uh, efficient if we can get ideas and get experience from other teams so that's basically two things i think very being very helpful for me like after i joined camp square yeah. hey thank you uh sarah Yes, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Ojanzade, and um, I actually started in uh, computer information technology for my bachelor's degree. And um, I, when I worked with software, I really wanted to know like how that software was developed rather than just using it, which is um, kind of the focus uh, in the technology side of um, things and I decided to uh, change courses or change um, degrees and uh, I finished my CIT but um, I tried to find professors in uh, computer science or computer engineering uh, and then I actually found Dr. Liu because I really was interested in the research he was doing with the cameras around the world. Uh, it sounded really interesting and um, useful with, uh, and also the, um, the things that required me doing, I had previous experience and I could also um, contribute. Uh, so that worked out and I started in summer 2017 uh, with, uh, with the team. Uh, I met so many uh, good friends that helped me throughout this way and um, really um, helped me to learn and do uh, better research and uh, write papers. Um, also, uh, we actually worked uh, with on a SBIR um, proposal uh, with my two good friends, uh, Ryan and uh, Kent. And um, yeah, a lot of things. Um, then I continued for my master's degree um, with Dr. Liu, advised by Dr. Liu. Uh, my thesis was on um, a computational geometry uh, problem. Uh, it was camera placement in uh, different locations uh, efficiently. Um, I can talk about that a lot more, but I'm gonna keep it short. Um, and then um, once I finished with that, I, am, I worked with uh, Abinov on a paper uh, regarding low power vision and uh, that's my current interest now so I'm trying to find my <laughs> I have enough um, I tried to uh, continue uh, with this uh, topic and explore and be able to find my um, PhD uh, topic yeah hey, great thank you Sarah and last but not least Jason all right. Um, it's interesting listening to everybody else talk so far. I think even though I graduated in 2004, there's a similar trend here that I think we've all kind of kind of followed. So I actually started as an undergrad in uh, at, at Purdue and um, you know went through freshman engineering. I actually couldn't decide between electrical engineering or mechanical engineering. I wanted to build cars at the time. Uh, but I found later that uh, if I went into computer engineering, I could satisfy my desire to go fast and, um, and go with my electrical kind of interests as well. Uh, so I went through all that through my undergrad, um, uh, usual classes, whatnot. We had, uh, one thing I discovered like Eric was programming right up front. It was all about hardware, 
hardware, hardware, hardware. And then I'll date myself a little bit, right? I learned, started to learn C. I thought that was fantastic. Just this, this, this great, uh, great way to do things. Uh, then I learned awk, you know, Java and then an assembly. And I think that software uh, expertise helped me look around a little bit more. Uh, I started looking at other jobs within uh, Purdue. So I was an ECM lab assistant. If you were, if you still have computer labs at, uh, we do. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So I have labs there. I was a grader for a psychology class. Um, and I got started working some of the labs within uh, Purdue itself. I was really heavily involved in Ada Kappa Nu. I hope everybody here is in Ada Kappa Nu. Uh, I was the workshop chair, the rec sec, the lounge chair, and the activities chair for a long time. So a lot of, a lot of just interaction there with uh, the greater, say, grade and student body. Um, then I actually stuck around for grad school, and I discovered my passion for uh, helping students. I was a TA uh, with Professor Eigenman for uh for a semester teaching the senior slash grad or excuse me taing the senior slash grad level os class and that kind of opened my eyes to like a leadership um kind of a, a a service kind of role and i really really enjoyed that and i've kind of carried that through my entire career actually up until today um after the, and after uh taing that class i found my real niche and that was taing the digital prototyping class or running that lab for Professor Johnson, if he's Mark Johnson still around there. Yeah, okay, all right, MC Johnson is still there. Great, and so, you know, we did things like, we, you know, I wrote, uh, rewrote, effectively the, the lab manual. I think even some of the pictures I, I, I created are still in use today, maybe, I don't know. Um, so I did that for a couple of years, and then late in my grad school career, I discovered Professor Lu, and uh, I think he was relatively new at the time, um, and I got involved in evolutionary algorithms, got a grant from DARPA, and we started working on, um, uh, developing or optimizing finite state machines in FPGAs. All new stuff at the time. I know it's old news now, but it was great, great, great to kind of get get in there and uh, and do some research. I actually did a non-thesis option, and so uh, graduate master's degree. And I kid you not that today, even though I manage a, a team within Intel, I use a lot of the words that Professor Liu tells me. Uh, pass that on to the next next gen of engineers. All right, Great. thank you all the panelists. Uh, I think we'll start off with Kawan giving off the first question. Mm, yes. Um, so the first question uh, we gathered from the students is who or what who or what inspired you to go down your current career slash academic path? How did that experience help you down the line? So um, anyone who wants to start first, you can start. I mean, I, I guess I'll, I'll take it. Oh, sorry, Jason. You oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Eric, go ahead. Okay. I'll, 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 use, I'll be the gap between you speaking. Uh, yeah. So specifically who would be uh, Professor Liu? I mentioned EC264 was probably my first tip, dip of my toe into the complex uh, computing at the time. Um, and, and I said, I, I thought that was really cool. And so I wanted to learn more. And that was just kind of drinking from a fire hose. Once you get an interest in it and you start looking into it, there's so much more. And then going and doing an EPICS uh, project in a semester, that was really, really exciting. I don't know if EPICS was around when you were there, Jason, uh, or if it was a relatively new thing. It's it kind of a program where you get real world application. Uh, it was a new Stuff thing. as part of a course and it counts as credits. It's a, it's a really cool project. And, um, and uh, that ended up getting me more interested in working with other things outside of just my courses. And that's how I got interested in Professor Liu's work. And so, um, Honestly, Professor Liu was my inspiration to pursue this career. I, I had not really decided, you know, I, I actually did an internship with a, a company called Coilcraft. They make a bunch of inductors, you know, they craft coil-based electronics. Uh, and I, I had done that and I'd worked for them for a little while and then uh, I had realized that hardware is not my passion, uh, which is good. That's kind of what an internship is to do, you know, to dip your toe in the water, see if you like it or not. And it turns out I didn't like it that much. And so I was kind of lost. And then um, working with Professor Liu kind of gave me better direction. And, and uh, please stop saying the obvious when he says, well, all right. Well, he's also the most humble person I know too, right? Uh, but uh, that is honestly where, where my career got pushed is through his influence and his, his assistance. All right, maybe I'll jump in then. So I think, I think where I got my kind of my career direction was, uh, I think was W3, ECE362. It's the computer architecture class. It's taught by Professor Vijay Kumar, TN Vijay Kumar. I don't know if he's still at Purdue or not. 
but uh, it was the first class that I think every day, every time we had class, I was just blown away. I'm like, whoa, this is amazing. And um, it just redirected all of my focus and my energies and my, uh, I changed uh, my schedule, everything to focus on computer architecture and, uh, and actually and software to support that. And that has kind of guided me um, it got me through, say, through grad school and my early job search and all the way till today. I'm still effectively architecting CPUs today. Great. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. If Ling and Sarah, do you guys have anything you want to share? Uh, so I, if one person did that decides my, I, I don't have a career, like, for my like pass forward then it's Professor Liu. So it's kind of like cliche that um, essentially when I try to find a research area, I was like, I don't know what to do, but it's very important to have a very good research supervisor like Professor Liu like, who can like look at what you are good at, talk with you and decide what kind of things you should like first try first. So uh, the experience at Camp Square, I was like choosing from a lot of different things. Uh, when I finished the Camp Square, uh, when I kind of like finished the Camp Square API, uh, I, I think I discussed with Professor Lu and we decided we want to like work on uh, image database, which is kind of like related to the Camp Square API, uh, but it's a more uh, focused area. So uh, also, uh, like speaking of like research supervisor, I think I'm very lucky to have another like good supervisor and uh, Professor Andy Pablo at CMU. So he also gave me a lot of like research ideas, a lot of like uh, guidance uh, in different ways, like which school I should apply, like which topic would be better to do kind of thing. So both of the professor are very caring and very good at like directing me in my future research path. So um, if I would suggest people uh, if I would give people one suggestion, is that if you are if you want to do research, if you want to work uh, in research area, is the first thing and the very important thing you should do is like find a good professor that can supervise you. Sure, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, for me, it's also the same. Like I agree with every point that Eric made about Dr. Liu. Um, he has also had the same effect on me through research. Um, but I just wanted to mention uh, another professor in ECE that um, I have so much respect for. Um, and just wanted for the students at Purdue who haven't taken his class or haven't met him, I wanted uh, to just introduce Professor Keck. Um, to me, he is really a pioneer in the work that he's doing um, and um, essentially the way that he teaches, uh, the way that he conducts his classes, so organized, so caring about his material and everything. It's just, it's amazing. And he's always so excited about teaching students and also the way he writes software. It's amazing. He's uh, he's not in the age that we are, but the uh, the software that he writes is, I don't even know how to explain it. It's so amazing, like uh, so clean, so perfect, all comments, all clear, very good. I mean, if you take his class, if you look at his uh, software and the books that he's written, you would understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, I totally agree. Yeah. I took Professor Kak's um, uh, 404, I think. It's the um, network security. Yeah, I totally agree. The way he wrote software is just amazing. All right, so we'll move to the next question, Gore. Um, sure. Uh, for, from your undergraduate life to where you are now, uh, were there many bears and setbacks? And if so, how did you overcome them? Jason, I see you're pondering there a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, no, I'm trying to think of the pondering setbacks. Well, I guess I could go while everyone else thinks. Um, for me, there there were a lot of setbacks, not necessarily in career growth, but in just getting my job done. Uh, I come from a slightly different world than a lot of people here. Maybe Jason has the most overlap uh, with uh, a corporate development. I work for probably the biggest company you've never heard of. It's called ABC Supply. Uh, and some quick context, if you've ever seen a house built or a building built, there's like a 40% chance that all the products come from or come through ABC Supply. Uh, but no one has any idea what it is. It's a very, very large company. But with that comes a lot of data and a lot of uh, engineering and a lot of understanding of those backend systems. And some of, some of the hurdles with working with a large corporation uh, is you're never going to know everything. And there's always going to be new things that come up during a problem, during a, a solution. So today you're working with, uh, you know, research in CAM2 and you kind of have an understanding of the whole ecosystem. Uh, and, and usually, you know, all the parts, you might not know exactly how they're, they're moving. Uh, but um, I should just close the chat. Professor Lee's distracting me with his questions right now. Uh, but uh, in a large corporation, oftentimes there's things happening completely that you're completely blind to. And so a lot of times what ends up happening is I'm developing a solution or I'm designing something new and something I either didn't know about or something brand new comes up. And that ends up being, I wouldn't call it a fire, but immediately it's, this is a problem. It's interrupting how I'm working today. I need to adapt to it, understand it, and then work around it or solve with it. And I think that's probably one of the things that I had the most difficulty learning to do because in an education environment, usually all the rules are set out ahead of you. Maybe there's some, some uh, requirements that are missing or some extra context that you're left to kind of work around, but there's never really a middle of the project, here's a change. You usually get everything up front and then you, you work to your solution. Whereas in the real world, I, I, and I shouldn't say real world, but in a corporate environment, as you're working, things change and they're, they're constantly adapting and it, it's confusing and it's frustrating at first, but I think it's a really, really powerful thing to, to learn to adapt to and to learn to work with. I'll actually second uh, Eric's comment there. I, I, you know, in, in, uh, in, my, in my work at Intel, you know, you're talking, I'm talking about a thousand person team and everybody working flat out as hard as they can, you know, change and, and adaptation, just the name of the game. If you can't do that, you just, you just can't get, you know, effectively the most complex machine ever built on the planet, right? Can't get that done. Um, I would say though, for myself, as far as, as, far as uh, um, roadblocks I ran to, when I was an undergrad, I had, just a, just a personal thing, I had a, uh, I had a hard time uh, speaking in front of groups. That was always something that I, that I had uh, problems with. And I think that was a, something that I had to grow into as I went through uh, grad school. Uh, actually, again, just a quick thank you, Professor Liu. He really kind of helped me uh, you know, learn how to do presentations properly, to technical presentations. And then going through Intel, that has been kind of the, the best place that I've been able to grow my own career is being able to confidently present in front of people and transfer my ideas to them. That has been uh, uh, just rocket fuel growth-wise for, uh, for a career. Yeah, uh, I think we'll move on to the next question. Also, if Ling, you have something to add? Uh, I was like, uh, uh, different from Eric and Jason, where it's, called, it's kind of like context switch from being a student to working. For me, it's more like uh, the course works out different when you're taking graduate level classes, PhD level classes, where uh, I think the course load in Purdue is a little bit more chill than SEMU. Another very different thing or disadvantage is that if we, uh, so because I'm in Pittsburgh, it's kind of like a city. So it's uh, less safer, less safe than uh, at Purdue. So that's kind of one drawback when I leave Purdue. All right, thank you. Uh, Kai, do you wanna give the next question? Okay, um, actually, Professor Liu posted the question in the chat. What do you hate the most when you were at Purdue? Well, I, I, maybe I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I think, I think for, for Purdue, what I hate the most about Purdue, 
Um, I thought Purdue itself was great. When I was there, West Lafayette was pretty underdeveloped. You just you didn't have very, very many places to eat, uh, especially you know uh, if you're looking for uh, any form of ethnic food other than Mexican food. It was hard to find some tasty, uh, tasty foods. Now I hear it's fantastic, or at least it's better than it was. So uh, that was the kind of thing that I hated the most. I feel like we were very remote from everywhere else. Uh, for me, uh, probably the, the thing I disliked most uh, was in my first couple of years, I was living on campus in dorms and, and the distance of the dorms to the buildings is just ridiculous. Uh, you know, it's a nitpicky thing. It's probably not a big deal to most, but uh, nowadays, you know, my commute to work is the same as my commute to class was when I'm on campus. Uh, and that seems like it's a really long commute. I, I feel like I lost a lot of time to that. And it, it's not something you can fix, right? It's a large campus, but I, I wish there was a way for me to either live closer to the classes I, I liked or lived in. Um, the last two years, I actually had an apartment really close to the electrical engineering building, and that was great. But uh, as an undergrad uh, in, in my first two years, I wish that were the case as well. Uh, the thing I hated most at Purdue is the weather. Uh, it's not so much as it's uh, like the winter is too cold or too windy here. It's more like uh, the weather is kind of like unpredictable. Even if you're looking at the weather report when you uh, go to school in the morning. So, and if you're like wearing the same clothes, like same kind of clothes you wear yesterday, you probably get cold or probably get too hot today. Uh, so that's, that's the thing I hated about Purdue. Others are fine. Like, uh, like Jason said, they are not uh, good food other than Mexican food. So when I was at Purdue, uh, there are a lot of like very good and authentic Chinese food, of course, at Purdue. So I thought, okay, because there are uh, many Chinese students there, so it's reasonable. Uh, but when I go to Pittsburgh or Cleveland, like those kind of cities, I didn't taste as much good Chinese food in neither like Cleveland, Cincinnati, or Pittsburgh. So that's very surprising. Like Purdue really has like great Chinese food. Yeah, I agree. Is it okay if I jump in? Yeah, sure. Of okay. Course. Yeah. Uh, so for me, I think uh, hate is a, is a strong word. It's not really hate, but just uh, a couple of things that can be improved, perhaps. Um, one thing I ha I've had like a few classes that were taught by uh, older faculty and they were not very engaged with students. Uh, whereas I had like a few classes that were taught by younger faculties and they were so much more um, better communicating with students. I've, at least that was my personal experience. So I think um, it would be good if like, obviously I know like uh, candidate faculties need to satisfy certain things, but uh, perhaps for Purdue to hire more um, recent younger faculties uh, for their classes. And also um, do like have some uh, way of um, essentially helping grad students, like PhD students mostly, to be successful if they want to go to academia. I feel like Purdue does focus uh, more on industry and people who want to join industry rather than uh, trying to, uh, I guess, develop uh, good uh, future professors that want to teach at universities. Um, and I, I know that this is something that um, Dr. Lu and I have discussed before, and I don't know if that's, um, I think it's, I think Purdue is working on it to improve, but just something that I thought to mention. Great, thank you guys. Um, I'll present the next question. Uh, for those current students right now debating between graduate school and industry, uh, what is one or a few important considerations you would suggest to evaluate in making the decision? Um, how did it apply to you when you made your decision? I guess this one's, uh, I, I can go here. Um, the, the one is, the, the big one right now is first of all, money, right? Do you have the ability to go to graduate school? Is it going to affect you financially? Or is it going to be best for you long-term financially, perhaps? 
Um, and the other one is, where does your passion lie? Uh, do you want to do really uh, application? Do you want to get your, you want to make your code or make your development and your re your research potentially work in an environment where you can see it every day to day and, and have it apply to something where you can say, hey, I did that, that's going across the world and you can make money off of it, you know, work for an organization or a corporation and say, hey, I helped these trucks save money on their gas mileage and uh, or I, I developed that algorithm that routes everything or these kind of things. That's something that I found really interesting. I did not go through a master's degree. I think I'm the only one here that just graduated with an undergraduate, went directly into industry. Um, and part of that was just applicate. I said, hey, I want to first, I want to start making money right away. And the second one was I really want to start making things that I can see in the real world and say, I'm proud of that. That's cool. Uh, and, uh, if I, if I could go back, I might consider a graduate degree. Um, but at the same time, I think I've got a decent amount of experience in industry as well. And so I don't think it's, it's necessarily, uh, one or the other. I, I think I would have had a fast track to some advanced, uh, more complex experience had I gone through graduate school, but I think I am able to reach that same level of experience more slowly working in industry. Uh, I would say like well, uh, most of us here going in the panel uh, uh, has experience in research. Uh, you may also want to try doing an intern and comparing like where like when are you the most happy happiest. So if you are really enjoying doing research, but enjoy less doing the intern, then you probably consider going to graduate school or uh, applying for PhD. If you're like, if you're like what Eric said, you, you enjoy like working in a, a company, working in corporation, like doing things that is actually practical, then you probably want to go to work. So like, it's really depending what your experience in either in both research and in internship. Yeah, I would agree. Internship is probably a really good way to, to suss out whether or not you want to go through research or to industry. That's probably a really good metric because if you can get an internship in the field that you enjoy or you think you're you might enjoy, that is really, really good, good suggestion. Thank you guys. Um, Kai, do you want to take the next question? Sorry. Um, so for the next question, uh, so personally for each panelist, what are you most proud of right now in your current either career path or um, academic study? Most proud of, okay, maybe I'll, I'll take that. Okay. So, um, so I've been in industry for, for 16 years. I guess uh, probably my pride there comes at, um, you know, I've, I've hired and, and trained and mentored probably one new engineer a year. That's the, you know, and every single one of them has effectively flourished, you know, flourished within, within Intel itself. And I can kind of trace that back to my, my days at Purdue when I was a TA and actually, uh, or working in, in Professor Liu's group, kind of working with some of the younger, younger students. It's just a, um, you know, a, a, a mentality of service is something that I've developed and getting, you know, new people to, to survive and, and, and be happy is, uh, is something that I'm, I'm most proud of. Uh, for me, it will be, uh, I have just finished uh, submitting a paper to CIDA, uh, although we haven't get the reviews back. Uh, I mean, I think the project is interesting, it's useful, it's kind of like uh, creative. Uh, but the thing that I'm most proud of is that it's the first time I'm like completing a paper like mostly by myself. So. Uh, for me, um, part of my job now is to own the full human capital management platform. Uh, for my organization and that entails a lot of integrations and engineering around um, interactions 
So for it's a platform called Workday. They actually recently IPO'd, I think, two years ago. And they're a very expensive organization now uh, because they are very successful. But um, that platform integrates with Equifax and it integrates with the Bureau of Labor Statistics and abundant, I think there's 20 different integrations. And with that comes a lot of complexity. And so with my work with Workday, as well as my work with my regular um, solution architecture job, I actually have designed and developed a lot of solutions that are now considered uh, globally contributed solutions within Workday as a whole. So if you were to implement Workday on your own corporation and you were to look at uh, guides or um, designs, uh, chances are you would probably be looking at a lot of mine on how to optimize your implementation. And so it's, it's kind of like a, there's an internal stack overflow and there's an internal guidebook. I'm one of the biggest contributors on their internal stack overflow. Uh, and so I'm kind of proud of that because it's kind of exciting, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a private platform, but hey, you know, I'm popular in a, in a very small niche community. Great. Uh, Sarah, you've also had a lot of research experience, I guess. What's something you've been really proud of during your time of research? Yeah, so um, for me, I guess, um, actually, that's what I wanted to mention. Uh, reading papers, uh, when I was an undergrad, like uh, when I actually even uh, started at the beginning, uh, reading research papers, especially those that I had like no experience or even like background knowledge, it was really hard for me to read and like understand and then like I would read it and then like a few hours later if you ask me what you read I couldn't like explain it or remember um it was just you know it's through practice um now I've got a lot better I still need improvement but now I can uh, read research papers easier and even those that are not in my uh, necessarily my background and one thing that has really helped with that is that Dr. Liu has let us uh, review like uh, publications from uh, conferences uh, as reviewers and like we get to together as a group and discuss our reviews and I think that was really helpful um, and that's I don't know if that's like a big thing uh, but it's something that I can be proud of yeah. All right, thank you guys. Um, question from the audience here. Is there something uncommon that you did at Purdue that you did not expect to help you in the future? Uh, I would say not necessarily that I did with Purdue, uh, but my passions. It, uh, I, I like video games uh, and there's a game called Minecraft. I'm sure most of you've heard of it. Uh, you can develop mods or uh, adaptations to the game in Java. And so I was really into Minecraft and I said, hey, I'm going to make a bunch of mods. And as a part of my passions and my hobbies, I learned a lot of Java development and a lot of, I, I learned a lot of best practices. And that ended up landing me my first job. My first job was a, as a Java engineer uh, for this organization I work for now. Uh, most of my experience at Purdue came in the form of Python and in the form of C, uh, which was not used at all at this organization. They used primarily Java when I first got here. And so that experience of my, my hobbies actually ended up giving me the ability to pass that coding competency test. Uh, and uh, that I was not, I was not expecting that. Right. But uh, everything else from the best practices and learning how to learn and all these engineering principles, those came obviously in handy, but the unexpected thing was when I took some of my passions and I, I furthered myself with those and that ended up paying off really, really well. I think that's something that if you find something you're really interested in today and it may not necessarily correlate to school, hey, maybe try to learn something in it and uh, maybe tie that with some of your education and that could help out in the future. I mean, I'll, ju I'll jump in here. So um, I think one thing that, that, uh, that I was unexpected is Purdue, Professor Liu once told me, he said people hire PhDs not because they're super smart, sorry PhDs, but because they know how to they know how to do research, they know how to learn, they don't know how to ask the right questions, they know how to get the work done, and I think that has has really kind of guided me right going forward, uh, especially in my career. It's that you know what you really should be learning and focusing is not necessarily obtaining all this knowledge. You know, it's really learning how to work, learning how to work together with other people. I think that's, uh, and that's what another thing that, you know, that I learned in Purdue is, is how do you network? How do you work with other, other students, maybe students you don't necessarily get along with or have a hard time working with their, their work stuff, but you still need to get the task done. And I think that's one thing that I, that I had unexpectedly learned how to do uh, at Purdue. All 
I think we move on to the next question now. Kai, do you want to take this? Sure. Uh, so the next, the next question is also a question from the audience. So what is the most important thing you learned when transitioning from undergrad academic environment to either higher edu education or work? I guess I can go with this. Um, so if, when I uh, transitioned to grad school, like at the beginning, we had like a few uh, seminars to get us ready and on track. And I remember um, Mr. Matt Golden, some of you may know him. Uh, he said that um, those of you who are here uh, were really good in undergrad, but that's not gonna be the case in grad school. And um, I totally agree with him. Uh, even if you were like the very best in your class in undergrad in grad school there's so much room for improvement um it's just keep learning and keep doing keep practicing keep communicating with people networking everything uh, you have to become good at it and uh, keep doing it to be um at the front i guess and that's something that i need to work on yeah for me uh and i'm sorry go no ahead. go ahead you go you got you beat me go for it for me, in uh, transitioning to a work environment, uh, going from education and in research, um, it, everyone knows what you're talking about and everyone kind of has a baseline understanding. You might have invented something new and cool, but you can still speak the same language. Whereas in a work environment, I'm often working with individuals who have no idea what programming even is. Uh, and so there still needs to be some transition of knowledge and explanation of the practices you're following so that you're on the same page. But one of the most difficult things for me to adapt to, and one of the things that I learned very quickly, was to communicate to my audience's education or technical level. So if I'm talking to somebody who has no idea what uh, you know Python even is, then I might explain to them using very layman's terms. Whereas if I'm working with somebody who's extremely experienced, I would be working directly with those technical uh, terms I would normally use. But the, the complicated part is transitioning my technical knowledge into analogies or into ways that that person might understand. It almost feels like you're talking to a toddler at times. And it's, that's probably the hardest thing that I notice a lot of my coworkers who are newer to the organization or newer to work in general. Uh, that's one of the things that most of them struggle with is making sure to curate their conversations to the technical level of their audience. And I think that's something that probably helps pay off the most when trying to communicate with others uh, from a technical standpoint. I'll actually double down what, what Sarah had mentioned earlier about going from undergrad to graduate school. You know, um, you know, grad, you know, undergrad. Uh, you know, we're all all kind of top of our class here, and then when you get to grad school, you realize that now you're you're one of just many, right? In this uh, in graduate school, and you have to run fast and and work very hard just to just to kind of keep up with everybody else right it's no longer um no longer th that easy and then even beyond that once you go from graduate school into the into the corporate environment you you you're hired into a oftentimes a group that is um you know packed full of people that have been there for you know a decade already and they're running very fast and they know a lot about what's going on and a lot of times there's no documentation for you to read up and find out what's going on it's like here get this done you know we'll, we'll come back in a week and um that was the i think the biggest challenge there was was is that it's just this wide open playing field and you don't know what's going on and you just have to start swimming because uh uh it's all it's all on you in the in the corporate environment to kind of tag onto that, Jason, in the corporate environment, is in your experience, has there been a lot of tribal knowledge of things? You show up and there's just absolutely. assumed knowledge? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, you know, a lot of times that's probably one of the biggest challenges that I find with, with new people is that when you jump in, th there's no like how-to manual to say, hey, you know, going from, uh, you know, what you learn in college to where we're at today in our research and development at Intel, there's no, there's no ramp up manual. It's like you jump in and you start talking the lingo and, so, and and I just tell people, new people, I said, hey, ask questions. You can ask me questions. And I get questions, even people that have, that have been there for two to three years. It's just, you know, we just have all this tribal knowledge, like, like you mentioned, Eric, that it's, uh, it's, it's a challenge to catch up. But you do catch up. It may take you five, ten years, but people catch up. Uh, so in undergrad, uh, you're, you're – uh, you're having, you can have 
uh, less initiative in like uh, what to study and uh, treating a course. So at undergrad level, the what courses you should take is more or less guided or decided by your major. You have certain uh, you have certain freedom in choosing like which course to select in one sub sections, but it's mostly guided. So you have you just have to do all the course and pass them, and you can graduate. You can uh, look for a job. It doesn't really matter. But at graduate level, you should take more initiative in like choosing what course you want to learn. Like uh, depending, you you need to start really thinking of like what you are going to do in the future. Like a year or a year and a half from now. So then you will need to take initiative to really select the course that can help you in your future. Like if you're uh, selecting a very, say, unfocused area of uh, courses, it might not help as much to your future uh, in your graduate study. So one thing that is very different at graduate level study is like you will need you will need to start taking initiative on what you are doing. Like. All right, thank you, panelists. Uh, I think we we'll take a few more questions here. Another question from the audience: um, How did your time in various teams and research opportunities at Purdue shape your career later on? Uh, did it help? get better opportunities? Uh, what did this experience teach you that made you think uh, and helped you do better what you do right now? Uh, th so this is actually very helpful for me, um, working in the research uh, group for CAM2. Um, the big thing was working and collaborating with other individuals. Uh, that's probably something that I didn't get very much of throughout my education. It's usually here's an individual project where you work on it individually. You might have some uh, you know, labs that you work with individuals on and you maybe have a team of three or four. But working with a team bigger than that, it wasn't something I had experience with at the time. And so there were two things I got out of it. It was one, other people were able to teach me their knowledge that I didn't necessarily have. And two, how do I collaborate on the same code or the same environment with others without destructively uh, developing things? In other words, I deploy something or I make a change, I don't want to break theirs. And that's where I learned the collaboration tools and leveraging Git and being able to code review with individuals to learn. That's something that I think is probably the, the biggest takeaway was the ability to do a constructive code review uh, and actually educate others as well as educate myself. So that's something I actually have applied in my current career is a standard code review every sprint. So every two weeks for my org uh, where we go through and we say, hey, let's take a look at your code. Let's take a look at your practices. And we go through a three-step process, make sure that the theory is understood, make sure that the syntax is understood, and then make sure that the best practice is followed. So uh, this code review goes through and, and says, hey, did you follow uh, the theory? Did you follow the proper syntax? And is it best practice? Are we optimizing everything? And I think that's something that I uh, abstractly learned through uh, CAM2 and through uh, the team. And I think that really paid off for me in the long run. You know, just just briefly here, I'll say um, I think I think for research research at Purdue helped me transition from a um, a information receiver, just like a sponge absorbing as much as I can, to learn how to ask the question of why, and that's really shaped my career going forward. As you say, if you listen to uh, others talk about their ideas, you just you learn to ask why, listen intently. You know, why are you doing this? What's wrong with this? What should you do here? And kind of help other people both give them positive feedback as well as kind of direct their own work and kind of helps you guide as well. So I think I think that research is really uh, at Purdue helped me help me develop that that skill that uh, a lot of times you just it's hard to hard to get if you're just uh, taking classes and listening all the time. Yeah, I agree. All right, so the next question is um, about writing papers. So what is the most important thing to look out for before submitting a paper to a conference or a magazine? Since Lynn just submitted a paper, how about we just start with you? What is the most important? Uh, I would say from my experience, most important thing is to double check your paper, like every detail. Uh, including spelling. Uh, so 
uh, one thing that uh, we had just submitted a paper, but one day after that, when I was kind of boring, I was looking at my uh, our submission, the PDF, and I find out that one of my graph was labeled wrongly. Uh, I was super panicked at the beginning, but uh, I told it. I told my uh, my uh, research supervisor, my supervisor. Uh, he, but he said it's okay. Like as long as the data is good, uh, you like we won't get into trouble. That like, that's what reviews for. But it still giving me a little bit a uh, disappointment because we are we have been working on this paper like writing uh proofread for several times of, but like the graph was put like generated at the very end like just before the submission so we didn't like double check it mm -hmm. so i would say proofread everything like not only what you what you write but also the graphs the uh labels even uh, the references, like double check everything before you submit. Yeah, those tiny details does matter. All right, um, Sarah, do you have anything to add to that? I think Ling pretty much covered it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we'll go for one more question, then we'll jump to the final conclusion. Well, I'll ask a question here. Um, I think an important one is that all of you have very strong leadership experiences as evidenced by your current positions that you have right now. Uh, what is one leadership advice you would give to students right now? And what is the importance of um, being a leader in industry slash research that applies to you? I guess from a leadership perspective, I'll just, sorry, I'll jump in real quick. Yeah, so I think, I think from a, you know, a leadership perspective, I think don't, uh, don't back down to your own ideas, right? But listen to others. Be confident what you have. Uh, take advice from your um, uh, from your team or from other people that you're working with, because often they'll often have better ideas than you have. So take those and integrate that into into your own, and then uh, give credit back to where credit is due. I think that as far as um, um, providing growth to your uh, your teammates, I think that's uh, one of the best things you can do. It's a kind of tie into that, Jason. I think another thing is don't be afraid to admit you're wrong. Um, it's it's huge, and it's something I think a ton of people struggle with. Uh, you would have no idea how much an impact of, hey, that was my mistake, I'll correct it, here's how, will have on a person. Uh, a common behavioral problem I notice with those that I'm that either report to me or are working on projects I'm working with is they'll just shy away when a problem occurs. They'll just silently work on it and the, it just becomes an embarrassing thing. Hey, I made a mistake. My code didn't work the way I wanted it to. And, and that, it makes sense, right? Hey, you made a mistake. You don't want to draw attention to it. But from a, an actual collaborative standpoint, if everyone is aware of the mistake, everyone knows what caused it, everyone learns and, every, and everything gets better as a result. And, and the email that says, hey, I'm sorry, this is my mistake. Here's what caused it. Here's how I'm going to fix it says so much more about your character and about your ability to, to work than just hiding. And I think that's something that was really, really powerful is just learning to, uh, to admit mistakes, but also alongside that to, to make a statement and, and con to kind of contribute on how you're going to improve that mistake in the future. No one's gonna look bad on you for making a mistake. Every single person in their career is going to write the wrong code or deploy the wrong thing or, or say the wrong thing. As long as it's not catastrophic and it's not going to cost millions of dollars, you're okay. And even then, when it does cost millions of dollars, it's a learning mistake, and sometimes it's still okay, anyways. Uh, so before before we like officially start, we were talking about like leader can be lazy by distributing the work among the uh, among the team members. So uh, I think one important thing is that is taking. It's also taking effort and intelligence for the leader to distribute the work to the right person. It's probably taking, um, it's probably easier for the leader maybe to do the work by himself or like randomly distribute the work to others. But it would be most efficient if the leader can know like the abilities and strengths and advantage of each team member 
and distribute the right word to the right person. Sarah, do you have any thoughts about your experience, leadership? Um, I agree with uh, all the panelists. I think we're kind of out of time, so I guess I'm, I can. All right, thank you. Um, well, we did start a little bit late, so I think I can squeeze in one more last question here before we wrap up. Uh, let's end with a, a, a more fun question outside of academics. Um, what's something you guys like to do personally when you're not studying, working, or researching, et cetera? And how do you make time to do other things you're passionate about? So I personally am still into games. I actually do something called Game Jams. That's where you work. It's kind of a hackathon, but specifically developing a game from the ground up and uh, releasing it into the world. And it's usually a prototype or a demo, but uh, that's something I really enjoy. I learn a lot from it and I get to meet a lot of new developers. It kind of plays into my career in the sense that I now find people I can hire if I ever have a position I need. Uh, but it's something that's really fun and it's something I do in my personal time. It's called the Game Jams. So I guess two things for me uh, on a on a personal level, I, I love hiking. Hiking in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest is just fantastic. Uh, this year I was dedicated to hiking uh, at least eight miles every weekend. Pandemic kind of put a put a kibosh in that, but I'm back at it again. So uh, I think I've done 27 hikes this, week, this year so far. But on a technical level, uh, I started something back actually right after grad school. I started uh, developing my own entire CPU system. I wrote my own compiler, my own OS. I wrote my own architecture. Uh, I didn't ever quite finish it, so I, I plink with that every every once in a while. And actually helped me get my first job at Intel when I started talking about this. Uh, it maybe helped me stand out. Uh, uh, for personal leisure, I I like to play games. I was kind of now into Animal Crossing. So, um, also, I so I was TA TAing this semester, and I find find it very very interesting. Like uh, uh, so sometimes I will take extra time in like fulfilling my TA ship. Uh, maybe answering questions on Piazza. I it is. It's feel great when you're helping people, so. Uh, for me, I guess I really don't find time to do very much <laughs> the things I like, but um, I guess I, I like reading, uh, reading things that are like about businesses, um, like uh, how I have like a favorite book. Um, it's how Google works. Like it's everything about Google and inside the uh, company. Um, anything that I can find, like, like uh, books like that, you know, like uh, time management, just leadership books, things that can help me improve uh, those kind of skills um, is what I try to do. Well, thank you guys. I was actually not aware there was a time limit, so I'm glad Professor Lou brought it up. So this means, of course, we can take more questions from the audience at any time. Uh, but if, uh, Kai, if you have a question, um, let's go ahead and keep the panelists rolling, keep them busy. I guess uh, the questions asked before basically cover what I want to ask. Um, well, I will, I will just add one question for um, anyone who's, who took um, graduate school. So what makes you decide to go to grad school? Like what, how, how do you decide on this project or college, this college, this university? Because me and Gore are both seniors and so we're applying for grad schools now. So we appreciate any kind of tips on that. I'll let Sarah Lane go first. You guys are newer to the decision. Ling, you can go ahead. Uh, like, so one thing, uh, I would say one thing that pushes me to make decision was the, uh, 
what's like who is the professor I will be working with at grad school like uh, what are their projects I might interest in so I would suggest if you have time or like if the if the schools that that give you offer you can try to visit the school and like talk more with the professor at the university to find out what they are currently doing so sometimes the uh, publications or other things at their uh, web page may be a little bit outdated like regarding only thing only the project that they have already done so even if you're interested they may have like shifted their focus and doing other doing researches in other areas so uh, probably make sure if you're getting offer at grad school, talk to whoever the your potential uh, supervisor, professor, uh, professors are. Talk to them and know like getting to know like what they're actually doing. Are you interested in their project? And like just go with the professor that you, the professor with the project that you are mostly interested in. So for me, um, I guess the, the main factor was financial help, um, scholarship, fellowship, things like that. Um, and also, obviously, I want the school to be uh, like in the top uh, schools uh, doing computer, uh, com uh, computer science research. Um, you know, you don't want to go to a school that's not really known. Um, uh, you want to be with the with the researchers who are doing the I guess the state of the art right um, so that's important um, and also like one recommendation that I will have um, for you too and also like the other um, students that may consider grad school is to try your best to apply to as many as uh, schools that you want because essentially I think a lot of it is chance like um, Dr. and I used to talk about this um, you might get like you might get into for I don't know like MIT, but you might not get into Stanford. Like you want to like apply to as many as you can. You have all the things that you like that they are looking for, but it's really it, it's a lot of uh, chance in play. I feel like so try your best if you can to apply it to as many schools as you can. Yeah, yeah I'll just add one more one more comment to the, that's a good point, good point by Sarah. Um, when you go into something, make sure you really love it because the work's going to be a lot. And so you have to do it because you love it. Um, and uh, choosing between actually graduate school or industry, you know, there was a, a professor, uh, Vijay Kumar, told me once, I said, why didn't you go into industry? Why not? He's like, in, in industry, what you'll do is you'll they'll give you a project. It'll be very difficult, it'll be very challenging, but it's that project. You know, when you're looking into going to grad school, you can choose what you want to work on. Right. You can, he was looking at like a, a thousand, you know, threaded CPU at the time. And he's like, that's what I want to work on. So think of it that way. When you go into industry, you work on what the company wants you to work on. And when you go into graduate school, you can be choosy and choose what you want to work on. So that's my, that's always been my dividing line between the two. Thank you. That's all very good advices. So um, I guess we're just going to wrap up, Gore. Uh, well, actually, I do have one final question. I think for those industry for those industry students who are interested um, in industry, um, for those panelists, what are some things you expect in a typical workday, and what do you do outside of your working hours, and how do you balance your work schedule with a personal schedule? So I guess for, for industry, I think there's a really nice thing with a uh, strong delineation from work and uh, from life, at least before COVID. Now with COVID, it's a little bit more ambiguous. But when you were at work, you were at work. When you were at home, you were at home. There was no bleeding of the two, which was really nice. Now that I'm working from home, I don't have that delineation. So that's really nice in that sense. You don't have to worry so much about keeping them separate aside from physically being in one place or the other. Um, but from an actual day-to-day -day thing, um, the, the biggest difference I would say between being in school and being at work is there's a lot less structure. As strange as it sounds, uh, for me at least, there's a lot less structure of my day-to-day. -day. I'm not doing this for an hour and then this for an hour and then this for an hour. It's usually an open-ended work on this project and then work on this project and however long it takes is however long it takes. 
there's still some, you know, capital expenditure and, and tracking there to say, hey, don't spend too much time on this. If it's not, you know, if you think it's going to take you three weeks, it's not worth it. Um, but it's, it's a bit different in the sense that there's no concrete. You're going to this class for this many hours. You're going to work on this and it's due on this day. It, deadlines are a little bit less structured uh, in a work environment. And it can be stressful and it can be less stressful depending on the situation. Uh, for things that can be more stressful, there are, you know, an ambiguous deadline, but it's a really critical project. Um, or there's a really hard deadline, like you have one week to get this to the government or we're getting sued for $10 million. That has happened before. That's really awful. And that's way more stressful than I think any school could ever been for me. Yeah, you know, actually, I think Eric hit all the points I was going to bring up as well. You know, school at the end of the semester, your classes are done and you can kind of forget about that. Right. But in the work in the work environment, uh, it just it just keeps going. And you may have projects that are a week long for myself. I have projects that are weeks. I have some that are months long and some that some that are, you know, three or four years long. Right. And try to plan all that. Plus, as also Eric pointed out, bringing in the financial aspect of things the you know the the personalities of teams that you're managing it just it adds to be this whirlwind of of activities that are just not as clean as a as a class or just a focused uh, piece of piece of research. Uh, but, but I I actually have the problem of of Intel being a, a, a multinational corporation that um, you know we work with people all over the globe and so it's 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 very difficult very challenging to try to delineate. Uh, personal time to work time because you know I'll have meetings in the evenings or in the very very early mornings, and so you have to you really have to be strict and carve out times of like this, this is me time right this is family time right now and uh, um, it's it's a challenge it's an ongoing challenge it has been my whole career but uh, you have to make it work or if you don't um, you, can, you can go crazy. Um, I just have a, actually a question from Jason um, so. Yeah. In the regard like in Intel, I know like a friend of mine, uh, she started working at Intel like a year ago and uh, she was she, she got her PhD and she started working and she told me that uh, one thing she actually really likes about industry and not uh, like grad school or academia is the fact that when you have a project, you work on it and like once you finish with it, like uh, at least get the things done with uh, that project, you get time off for yourself. Uh, but in academia, that's not the case. Like um, you keep the like, constant, constantly you have to be in the lab working, reading paper, writing paper, like research keeps going. But uh, at Intel, like the project that she was working, it, like it was a, it was very difficult for her, like days and nights she was working on it. But once that was finished, she said she got like a, a day or two for herself just to relax. Sure, sure, sure. We do, you know, you do have to, re we do realize that uh, when you're working in, in, at Intel or any corporation for that, right, we realize that this is your, like your life, right? And uh, yeah. at least in grad school, you say, well, I'm going to work really, really hard uh, because there's an end to this, right? There is a, a goal that I'm trying to reach where, where in, in, in corporations, right, we realize that this is, this is what you have to live every day, day in and day out. And so when we are pushing hard to get a project by a certain deadline afterwards, yeah, you need some time to, to decompress. And that's something that we, we definitely want to make sure people have because uh, after you decompress, back at it. Yeah, yeah, it. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I, will, I will say in industry, there's a little bit difference too in the sense that in, in education or in the academics, uh, when you're done with a class, it's done. You know, you don't have to revisit it. I, Jason kind of alluded to this. Uh, but with industry, you kind of, it's like having a child when you finish a project. For the most part, you've raised it and it's grown right and it's fine. But there are going to be times where that child or that project needs your assistance again. And so you never really have a clean break from anything you've done. So the longer you are with an organization, the more stuff you've built up. And I think that's one of the things that I notice is problematic for a lot of the, my coworkers that have been here for 20 years is those 20 year coworkers half of their workload is just their old work that isn't perfect or wasn't designed with that idea of, I'm gonna hit my lottery ticket tomorrow, I'm out in mind. And so that's one thing that if you go into industry, the thing I wanna stress the most is, when you design and develop something, design it with the idea that you're not gonna be here tomorrow and everyone else should be able to pick it up. Not because it's best for the company, but because it's best for you. And it's, it, you always hear people talking about, well, it's, it's, uh, 
it's insurance. You know, I need, they need me in order to support this product or they're screwed. Well, at the same problem, you can't ever move on to a different project without that being dis like completely disconnected from you. So that's something I think a lot of people struggle with is making sure that they can cleanly break from stuff they've completed because in, in academia that happens naturally when your project is done or when your, your grad degree is finished, you get that clean break. Um, whereas in industry, unless you change jobs, you're attached to everything you've completed. Does that, is that aligned with what you've experienced, Jason? Oh, Eric, you're, you're like speaking to my entire job. That's uh, yeah, absolutely. Everybody has their own and there's no documentation. They just kind of keep going because they are the central portion, you know, the connection for that information and they're happy for a promo or for moving someplace else. And it's like, hold up, you still need to support uh, what you've done before because there's really nobody you've trained nobody or, or helped ramp anybody up to cover that. All right, thank you guys. Um, I think we've covered very thoroughly all the questions regarding um, industry, research, graduate life. Um, I, of course, I want to thank Professor Liu for organizing this. I want to thank all our panelists, of course, for their insightful information. Uh, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Jason, Ling, and Sarah. Um, for those of you who are still interested, we have another panel coming up in um, almost next week, October 11th. That's a Sunday at 2 p.m. EST. Uh, please join us that time if you're interested. Uh, if there's no other further questions, we'll wrap up here. Thank you guys for coming.